Hello everyone! In honor of today's interview subject, I'm going to play a little game called Truth or Dare. Cameraman, say Truth or Dare. Truth or Dare? Ah, oh, fuck me. I meant show and tell. Show and tell? No, I mean, today's interview is with magic artist Jeff Lobenstein, and he did the card art for show and tell, and I don't know why, but for some reason I mixed the show and tell out for Truth or Dare. Oh, Christ. I bet there's a card called Truth or Dare. Okay, I need to find something for show and tell. But while I'm doing that, please enjoy my chat with Jeff, and I can honestly say that it was a break from the recurring nightmare that is my existence. Is I do have two recurring nightmares that I bought, and I left them at home and I just remembered that. Just remembered that. Just remembered that. Roll the interview. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. My pleasure. Okay, so... Tell us the Genesis story of how you got started with Magic the Gathering. What was, what was the, the beginning? Okay, sure, easy. Um, I had been working in the role-playing game field since 1985, working at a company called FASA. We were doing Battletech and Shadowrun and Earthdawn and those sorts of uh, RPGs. Um, and we were regularly attending Gen Con. Uh, about 1993, I would think, 92 or 93, um, Jesper Mirfors, who was somebody that I was acquainted with through RPGs, um, came up to all of us at BASA asking us to work on this cool new game they're going to be putting together. And um, our boss, uh, imagine that, uh, said, that's competition, so you can't. So, so much for being an alpha artist. Ooh, try not to dwell on that. Um, be that as it may, uh, virus, Jesper kept asking us, uh, he's a very sweet man and uh, very supportive of the artist, as everybody knows. Yeah. Um, the following year, he handed me a pile of alpha cards saying, this is what we did. I want you to work on this. And so probably best convention swag ever. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still have those. Um, but uh, three, four years later, Jesper kept asking. And we kept asking. Finally, the boss said, sure, go ahead. You can work for them. And from that point on, I did several cards in each set uh, for the remainder of the time that Yester was there. Um, and I had a blast working on it. They gave us all sorts of freedom. Um, and uh, it was a delight. And uh, I'd do it again in, in a minute if I could. And you have such a very identifiable uh, artwork uh, style that it's, it's impossible to mistake it. Um, what, what would you say your inspirations were as far as, as, as what helped you develop your you know, kind of style as an artist? Well, for, for the magic cards, uh, well, and in general, um, in college, uh, the <laughs> instruction was pretty much, we need six canvases in three months, see you later. Um, my watercolor teacher, on the other hand, uh, showed us technique and helped us develop as uh, painters. Uh, I also had a phenomenal uh, illustration instructor, Mark Nelson. Uh, in fact, several of the uh, magic artists are also students of his, and he also did some cards. Yes, yes. Uh, so the uh, the pen and ink work, which certainly lent itself to role playing games, uh, was heavily influenced by the training I got from Mark. That being said, I was also an art director at FASA, and um, I was thinking the magic cards. You're basically painting a potion stand. It's gonna be this big. Um, so when I painted the cards, which were about so big. In fact, I have a few I can show you in a minute. Oh, um, yeah. The, uh, I was thinking to myself, they're going to shrink way down. It's either going to get muddy or I have to do something to make the colors pop and the details pop. So I used a heavy outline because I was in the, you know, a pen and ink guy anyway. So I used a heavy outline on everything and fairly pure colors because I wanted all the little details to jump out when you looked at them on a card. Now, when you look at the cards, I think they are very clear. You can see everything that's happening in frame. When you blow them up, they're cartoony as heck, but <laughs> just that worked out. And, 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 and I liked it. We were, all, um, we were all brought in to bring various different styles and approaches to the game. So each car was immediately identifiable. And I think that's true, as you said, with the ones that I was doing, certainly. They do look like my work. I painted them that way on purpose. And as I do new pieces for my tokens and such, I paint them the same way just so that they'll look like they belong to the old sets. Have you always had a dark edge to your to your work? Uh, because I know with a lot of some of your pieces, there is a 
very uh, uh, horror driven aspect to it. And um, you know, is that's, that some, that's, that's is that ironic. That natural. Most folks find my work very whimsical and silly. So I'm, but I do enjoy doing uh, darker pieces. Um, you know, uh, monsters are fun to draw and create. Uh, there's nothing, nothing more fun than being able to make something up. Um, and Jesper gave us that kind of freedom. Um, you know, Scragnaut, I need a monster with a green background. <laughs> After that, it was me playing around. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, because it's like you got, uh, let's let's see with your, um, we got, I mean, your token, right? like your, your Sapperling token, that is certainly different than any other token Sapperling we've, we've seen. Um, and even uh, like uh, when you look, I mean, Molting har Harpy, it's just, it's, it's pretty terrifying when you, when you look at it. I mean, yes, there are some whimsy, but then again, there's the Douthy Horror, which is <laughs> not terribly whimsical. The Douthy Horror was a fun one. Um, it was another monster like uh, Sapperling. Uh, Jesper said it needs to be a monster with kind of an orange cast to it. Um, and me being me, my first thought was, what would Captain Kirk fight? <laughs> so I did this big sort of rubbery headed guy with uh, an orange faded background like they used to use in the old series. And um, so I was literally trying to do kind of a 1960s, you know, rubber faced movie monster <laughs> for <laughs> that guy. Isn't it funny how then uh, uh, was it um his uh, was it William Shatner's face ended up becoming the rubber mask for Michael Myers like this weird a, isn't that correlation. amazing I know right maybe you you were shadowed it um but um the things that I really also do enjoy about your pieces is just like that they I mean again it's 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 they really do stand out but there's also there's also sort of like um a hallucinogenic quality to them as well. <laughs> Um, did you, was that something that came right into your like ideas? I mean, wh when you started doing it, I mean, or was it something that evolved over time? Cause like specifically recurring nightmare, I mean, that must've taken a, quite a while to, to, to do. I mean, how, how long, how long do you have <laughs> a piece like that? Well, generally, um, generally the compositions came together very quickly, um, and I don't know if this is a good spot for it or not, but I have one of the sketchbooks sitting here that has um, most of the drawings, literally, it was a one shot, show and tell. I just drew it out and that was the final composition. Um, that was true of probably 20 of my 24, 25 paintings. The first idea was the finished idea. Uh, Recurring Nightmare, I did three versions of. Uh, I did the guy laying down because it was the guy sleeping having a nightmare. Then I did one that has sort of uh, three little monster alien looking guys behind him. And then I did the toothy eye thing. And <laughs> I don't know where it came from, but that was the one we went with. Um, and, yeah, uh, no, this is a perfect time. If you, if you, and by the way, if you want, like, um, if you want to show the, this, the, the pictures um, while live, we can show them. Or if you want afterwards, you can show them to me and then send me photographs of them and I can juxtapose them in so they're nice and clear. Um, which tell, I you what, tell you what, I'll send scans of the, 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 the uh, sketchbook pages as soon as we're done. In the meantime, give me a second and I'll see if I can uh, find something yeah. to show you here. Oh, that'd be fantastic because this is the kind of stuff people like love to see. Uh, I may have to slide the uh, camera back a little bit. All right, so um, I don't know if you, can, you probably can't even see this. No, probably not. But as I'm going just, to this Just go ahead and talk about them as though as though we can see them because we will be able right. to see them. This thing's there. loaded with Battletech, but at the end, with the metronomes, I had to figure out how the heck they worked. So I drew several pages of essentially anatomical drawings of the metronomes jumping up and down. I had to have a consistent look so I could draw them. So there's probably six pages of various gnomes before you get to the finished composition. Which, wow, uh, I guess it's right there. Wow, it's and, it's and, and like um, copper gnomes is the, the the next page, and it was just a one-off composition. It came together because I knew how to draw them at that point. The next page is that it shows out. <laughs> and are these the original? Yeah. And um, it's, and then do you do you have any of your original pieces uh, still, I, or have you? I have. 20, 
five, no, I did 25 paintings, and I have 21 of them. So, like, there's Scrag, huh? <laughs> wow. Here's Ape, Apes of Wrath. Are you talking about this guy, Dowdy Horror? And uh, because I was showing you the composition, this one's a little bigger, but that was the metronomes. <laughs> and, and you don't have any, and you're not tempted at all to, 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 to put them on the market or? Well, I sold four of them about four years ago now. And the rest are still here. Um, I figured that I would perhaps make a third of them available. I just haven't made any sort of effort to do it. <laughs> and then I would like save a third of them for my family. Mm -hmm. And then put the last third of them, you know, back in the drawer and see where they are in, you know, 10 years. Well, I mean, they're, they, hopefully they'll go to like a museum or something. Cause that's, that's sort of my, like, cause you know, I mean, I, I think about like the legacy of, of the, the art and like, you know, if it doesn't have an owner and if like, say, I mean, for, for, you know, in your instance, you have a family, so that's, that's good. But like some people don't have, you know, immediate offspring. So like, where are these going to go? And, and a lot of the pieces have been. A lot of the pieces were sold back in the day, especially the old school stuff. Um, certainly, the modern stuff. Geez, it goes out of the market as the cards are being premiered. Yeah, um, yeah. Which, which is, which is very interesting and changes the game quite a bit because certainly for the longest time, the art was valued not by the image but by what the card does. And I'm lucky that people also like the paintings I did. Um, but nowadays. You know, if there's a cool image that comes out, people are bidding on it immediately. Um, and, and it's fascinating. It's, it's quite amazing to watch. And I mean, there still is, I mean, there still oh. is interest in, what was that? Oh. Somebody wants to say hello and go outside. Who's that? <laughs> Sorry what's about that. that? What's, what's their name? Uh, Winnie is the big white one, and Rosie is the beagle by my feet, and they're both telling me it's time to go outside. Oh, do <laughs> you need to? Can, do you no, need my to son can a... take. My son can take care of them. Oh, okay. Just, uh, I, got, for I, attention. Got, I got five shih tzus on my bed. <laughs> it's a dog babysitting weekend. But what's cool is, um, is your stuff is still, um, you know, getting some notice. Like for instance, um, I believe Martyr's Cause was reprinted for uh the uh, the um mystery booster uh. That which no. mm -hmm. they don't. I, I never hear. Um, yeah, yeah. I in think fact, you... the first proof I got as a reprint happened about six months ago for uh, growth spurt. I hadn't seen a single reprint since 1997 or so. Well, you were <laughs> reprinted in 2001. I or, I'm sorry, 2001, 2021. Or yeah, yeah. For Martyr's cause was reprinted for. Um, mystery boosters so maybe wow. i know i know it takes a while for them to to get the artist proofs to you um you know it's a longer timetable um but yeah yeah you're you're definitely in there because you you recognize your art and you're like this is different this is new and it's 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 you know it's it's cool to see you in there which leads me to the next question and we talked about this a little bit um uh you 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 have expressed that you would love to be involved with the game in you know some way shape or form uh you know, in the future, and um, it's just, I wanted to know uh, your thoughts on that. It, 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 oh, I, I think it'd be great to be involved again. Um, my most recent card, other than these couple of reprints that I've just learned about, uh, was uh, Vine Dryad, and that was, I don't know, 2003 or something. I painted it in Germany at a show, <laughs> um, and in fact, uh, I tried to mail it from London, uh, and it got hung up in the Royal Mail for like three weeks. I could have walked it from Chicago to Seattle. <laughs> God, that must have seized faster, you up. faster than that. But uh, no, there's a thing called Spiel. It's a big uh, RPG uh, convention in Essen, uh, Germany. And I had gone there as a guest a couple of times. And the, the second time I went, I was still working on painting all those leaves on the dryad. So I was sitting at the table in Germany painting my dryad. And then uh, I took it on a train to London and posted it from London. And for whatever reason, it took weeks to arrive. But um, <laughs> I should have just taken it home with me on the plane, but I didn't know. I mean, <laughs> so. and did you have any idea that 
some some of the cards when your cards when they came out did you have any idea that they were going to be the powerhouses that they were i know um, no i think i think Gasper was very kind and he gave me some very nice pieces uh reflecting upon it i think that a quarter of the of the paintings i did may still be in play in one form or another whether it's oh. copper or legacy or like you just said martyr's cause has come back as a mystery pack um i think that's amazing um, and I'm, and I'm grateful as heck that, uh, that the cards still have some life in them. I mean, recurring nightmare has, um, uh, has a mythological uh, aspect to it because it's one of the few cards that is actually banned in commander. It's so powerful. Like it, it it's, it's the, the, the committee was like, it's, it can't, it, it would break the game, which is pretty, I mean, yeah. it's pretty intense. One, one, one of my, uh, <laughs> jokes on recurring nightmare is people uh, will tell me that car is so broken. Going by broken, you mean awesome? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's yeah. That's basically it. Like if, it, if it, it's um and um one of the one of your fans wanted to know now, do you base the paintings off of people that you know, or they just do they come completely off of uh, your imagination? Uh, specifically, recurring nightmare. Um, well, people people have suggested that the recurring nightmare guy and the show and tell guy are the same person, probably because of the loopy hairdo. Hmm. But. Um, Looking at this big round melon, I'm sure that there is an aspect of me in there, even though I'm not a, a skinny guy with a strange cropped haircut. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it reflects, you reflect yourself in your work all the time. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Todd Lockwood points out that I draw broken noses all the time. And um, I'm sure that it has to do with the fact that I went over a waterfall in a rubber raft with my sister and a canoe, or, or my sister, and as we went over, she turned and pivoted it and clipped me across the bridge of my nose with her paddle as we hit the water. And subconsciously or not, I, I draw a break at that same point often. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's Ouch. Dope. That was just funny. You just bring stuff to the table. Uh, metronomes. In the metronome, there is a trilobite sitting on the shelf. That's sitting on my shelf. Um, <laughs> you add stuff to the pictures just to, you know, invest yourself in the narrative and or to help the pieces feel like they're part of a bigger world. Uh, the little details and stuff, the, the storytelling that occur, occurs helps build the world. The show and tell guy is loaded with little characters and strange little details. Yes. That I think helps build the piece and make it more interesting to look at. And what was the story for show? I mean, cause show and tell, I mean, I, 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 what did the what did the uh, the brief say, and and how did that evolve from what the brief was to what became the painting? All right, so a lot of the briefs were like three sentences. Uh, the show and tell guy. I mean, literally, when I was talking about Scragnoth and Dobby Horror, it's like it's a, it's a red monster, it's a green monster. Show and tell it was it's a guy in a classroom. The box of tentacles. That's me playing around. The Kabuki person. I don't know, that might reflect a little bit of shadowing, which I was working on at that time. Um, when you say shadowing, you just mean like uh, like shadows, like... Um... No, Shadowrun is an RPG set in oh. the cyberpunk future. And I was I did a lot of the archetypes and the characters for that around the same time frame, uh, late 90s. So I, I'm guessing that she might have popped in there from Shadowrun, just as you know, uh, a visual I was comfortable with. Um, but... You know, the box of tentacles, the weird blue uh, creature on the right, or the eyeball, the bag with the eyeballs in it. Let's just be playing around and having fun. And it's and, and it really has become, I think, I've already, if we were to say, like, one of the more iconic of, of your pieces. It, it would be yeah, it, it is. It, it has some life. In fact, I didn't know that they were building decks around it until about six years ago. Um, I didn't know oh. that it was a powerful card. Yeah, it's, um, it's it's one that I've yeah, it's sort of the ones that you hear about like, you know, from, you know, from afar, the sort of like this card can do this and that. As a matter of fact, I wonder what like the original goes for. I'm curious. Yeah, those Urza decks or Urza sets were very powerful and still impact the game today. Um, I was lucky yeah. it was a good it was a good time to be involved in it. Uh, the funny thing is, at shows and stuff, people will come up and say, "Hey, are you uh, are you done with my alteration?" And I'll go, "Which one is yours?" And they'll go, "Show and tell." And I'll go, "They're all show and tell." Yeah. <laughs> like, they're all show and tell. 
I need a little more than that. Though, though, I've just started doing some paintings on um, Martyr's Cause. So like you said, that, that must be why I'm starting to see people ask me about that one. Yeah, that's it's it, it got re, yeah it got reprinted into uh, the mystery boosters. It's a it, and and it really again stands out because you just see this. You're like, well, this is this is so different stylistically, and um, you know, so that that leads me to believe, and and I and I am an advocate for for all of you guys, uh, you know, the earlier magic artists getting uh, some sort of um, a secret layer like. I think there's an opportunity for that. I, think I there do is too. An opportunity. Uh, it's. I've actually talked with a couple of people, not at Wizards, but you know, artists at shows, and they're all like, well, you know, a lot of people have gotten work again. Uh, are you interested? And of course I said yes, but at the same time, I'm thinking something like a, a secret lair box that was just, say, goblins, for example. I painted, I don't know, almost a third of my cards are goblins. Yeah. Uh, and, my go and my goblins are different than Pete's goblins or are different than Wayne Reynolds' goblins, but they yeah, would be I'm readily recognizable. I mean, if, if, or even if it was just a uh, sort of like a, a mix of the different styles of goblins, like if you just had one artist doing one goblin, you know, like, and then you have five, yeah. all, you know, I mean, the, the results are kind of, or not the results, the, 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 uh, the possibilities are endless. It's, it's, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of opportunity there. And I think everybody would be delighted to do a few fresh pieces. I would. I mean, I, again, and I say this in every interview, but I love the idea of full circle. I love the idea of people coming back from the beginning and doing, you know, Cameo, there's just something so satisfying about it, you know, like about seeing a recurring character in a sequel coming back and kicking ass, you know what I mean? Like the, mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. just, just that kind of, um, that just like that's that full circle feeling you get from it. Now, um, one person, one, another fan, um, wanted to ask, uh, they said that there's rumors that you have a lot of artist proofs that are in your basement that are not, um, currently. Two thirds of my proofs are missing. They're in the house. Uh, I haven't seen them since maybe 2002. Uh, it includes Miss Cal, most of my goblins, um, martyrs. I think I have a few martyrs cards, but the ones that I bring to shows, I think there's about 12 cards that I still have in my binders, and the rest are in the house. Um, that being said, I found, I think I told you down in Tampa, I found uh, copper gnomes and metronomes over the holidays. So I now have, I now have, you know, 50 or so of both of those proofs and they've been sitting in a box for 25 years. Like I found a show and tell for the first time last fall. I hadn't seen one since about 93. Um, what do you think uh, could have happened to them? Well, they're in boxes. I have, I have boxes. I was an art, as an artist in the RPG field. I have multiple copies of pretty much everything I was published in. I also was sent boxes of stuff by WotC. Um, when we for, when you did a set, they wouldn't send you your card. They would send yeah. you a box of product. Um, so I'm assuming somewhere there's a box of product. In amongst the box of product are, is a little white paper box with proofs in it. Um, how old, is, they, how they old say, is your son? Uh, I have two boys. Uh, boys, no, one's twenty-five, one's just about twenty-one. Okay, they're um, young. They can get down there and do some lifting and get it get, get, get well, and, <laughs> well, and that's how I ended up finding copper gnomes and uh, metronome. I was looking for uh, my show and tells. I was looking for. Uh, a stash of the proofs. They must, there must be one. I just have to find it. And uh, you could always be like, you know, the payday for that would be pretty, you know, like not, not too shabby if you kind of help me out with that. I mean, you know. Yeah, the, uh, the, uh, I I've sold a few of the uh, show and tell proofs and they've been very expensive. Yeah. And you know what? And good for you. Good for you on that. Because I mean, it, 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 and it's always exciting to talk to artists who, you know, when you think about the actual, uh, the, the 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 actual like realm of possibility of being somebody who is an artist that can charge X amount of money for a piece of work, and and that you're one of them, that you are one of these people that are in like a percentage of artists that are you know so rare, it's it's just got to be uh, it's mind blowing. Astonishing. It's astonishing, and I'm grateful as heck. Um, the fact that anybody remembers this stuff all these years later uh, blows my mind. I mean. Magic was a side freelance gig for me. I was working full-time in the role-playing game field. And yet 
20 some odd years later, I started doing the shows and I did you know, 15 to 20 shows a year for a couple of years prior to COVID. Um, now that things are beginning to ease up, I started doing shows last June. Uh, I went to a shop in Phoenix uh, in June 2020 or 2021. Um, and from that point on, started doing shows. I had nine of them last fall in 12 weeks, uh, which is a little crazy. Uh, but already on the books, I've got 17 shows for this year. But you have to look. You have to be turning things over and figuring out, you know, this is the regional show that's doing uh, a tournament series. This is a shop that wants you to come. This is a big event. Uh, and, and then string those together. And uh, there's several of us. Uh, Randy and I have been doing it. Uh, Brian Wackwitz has been on the road. Ken Meyer's been on the road. Uh, Chuck Lukacs has started to go out. Um, but, you know, it feels like you've got a machete in the jungle sort of hacking your way through the forest trying to figure out a path. And yeah, yeah. It's, ha it's, happening. it's happening. It is. And it's, well, it was great to see you. Uh, it was great to see all of, all of you down. Uh, oh, the TCGC guys, you know, that was a new, a new set of uh, events. They started last summer and Randy and I were at each one of their events uh, and have been at, each, which, each, at all of their events. Um, but Star City started up again this spring. Uh, there's a there's a series in Chicago, Nerd Rage, Ga Nerd Rage Games, um, and they're doing shows in Fort Worth and Minneapolis and in St. Louis. Um, I'm still looking for something on the West Coast. Um, you'd think there'd be a series along there. Um, I think that maybe the West Coast is probably tougher because I think there's a little more draconian uh, that's like rules. True. With, uh, that being said, that being said, the next uh, battle for Puget Sound, I think it's called, mm -hmm. um, just got announced, and I'll be participating in that. So really, in Seattle, yeah, 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 it's gonna be fun. So, what would you say of if you were to pick one piece of art that you did for Magic that was the one that just came out the easiest, that was just like cake versus one that gave you the most trouble? Uh, what would those two be? All right. Um, Jeez, that's hard. Uh, one of the things about the paintings, and, and people ask me all the time, what's your favorite piece? Um, because we had so much freedom, there's a lot of ourselves in the work. Um, clearly, and I've said it a few times, I was playing around with some of these compositions, trying to make them fun for me. Um, Apes of Wrath was a, was a blast and super easy to paint. Uh, I was a big fan of Planet of the Apes, so, and King <laughs> Kong, so I think both of those come, come forward in, in that painting. Um, a tricky one to paint. Well, logistically, um, Vine Dryad, in that I was painting it at a show um, in Germany, <laughs> that, that made it a little bit complicated. Plus, there's lots and lots of little details on there. It was sort of a weird composition, and uh, there are some characters that were part of the the, uh, the narrative involved in it. I think somebody named Jared, and um, I forget the, other, the the woman, but those were specific characters from the Weatherlight, I believe. Well, now, what made you paint that at at a, at a convention? What was the the, the reasoning behind well, the, time, the time frame? I I was committed to going to a show, and I had this painting, so you know, clock was ticking, and I had to get it done. So I just brought it with me, <laughs> and then that's why I was mailing it from London, trying to get it to them as fast as possible. That's, I mean, that seems like an, an insane amount of pressure. Um, have you ever thought of recreating uh, your, like, your pieces for? I've done one repaint. I did a repaint of Show and Tell for a fellow a couple of years ago. I painted it very large. It's uh, 18 by 24. And um, what was that, that experience kind of, like? I enjoyed it. It was weird because the, um, the originals, as I was showing you, are fairly small. Um, when you blow it up big, you have to either have a huge outline to be true to the painting, or you start crisping things up because of its scale. So the repaint, uh, and again, I'll, I'll send you a copy of this, uh, oh, yes, is, do. I think the colors are more luminous. Uh, the detail, it's, it's got a finer detail, even though the composition is the same. Um, so when you put the two side by side at the same size, um, I think that the uh, the repaint, um, I don't know, it sparkles. Uh, that's, that sounds silly. 
uh, th there's a luminosity to it that doesn't exist in the original painting. Um, and what would you say, and I know the favorite painting question is, is silly, but if you were to say, like, if you were to give, um, you know, a greatest hits, and this is, and this is uh, your entire career uh, outside of magic as well, is there a piece that you just are, like, you would say, this is the one that I knocked out of the park. This is the one that I would like to show, um, say, like, you know, a tribute to me if there was, like, the, uh, you know, the Oscar <laughs> tribute or something. That's funny. Uh, uh, there's a few. Um, there was a spirit, uh, a spirit of sorts. It was a woodland spirit, a tree guy, um, like an ant like an ant that I painted for Earth Dawn that I'm quite proud of. Uh, some of my black and white drawings, uh, especially the, the ones that were um, in Shadowrun or Earth Dawn, I was really proud of. Uh, in the magic paintings, um, I really liked how show and tell work turned out. I wish I didn't put so many teeth on Recurring Nightmare because when I redraw, it takes a long time <laughs> to draw all those teeth. I think, yeah, um, <laughs> you, you did have a, was it a redraw of Recurring Nightmare that was at the um, TCG I, I paint. I painted the monster minus the guy. So it's just the eyes and the eyeballs. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't, there was some metal in it too. Am I remembering it? Or like you did some sort of metal uh, drawings um, too? I, I think uh, there was, there was, there's a little bit of type on there, but um, I don't think there's anything else other than just the eyes and the teeth. Um, Geez, that's a crazy piece. Um, I redrew it in Seattle for somebody as a play mat. They just wanted the monster, so I drew it out. And it, you know, you, you start one corner, start working yourself around, just doing circles <laughs> as, as you work your way in because of all all those layers. Um, but when it was done, I thought, heck, this is cool looking. I should paint it. And so I took a photograph of it and then redrew it and painted it based off the sketch that I did in Seattle. And that became that particular play mat in print. Um, and that's, I mean, that's just so cool. I mean, yeah, but there is, there's a lot of teeth. There's a lot of teeth. Um, <laughs> um, one, one of the ones that, that I'm curious about is, is double cross. Like, what's the story? Uh, there is a story there. In fact, it's a bit like animation. If you look at it, mm -hmm. there are three, there are three, uh, three frames, if you will. Yes. The entire composition shows the guy, he's already been battered, and he's holding a crystal uh, ball in his hand, and there's missiles coming in. If you look at the crystal ball, you can see the missile hitting him. He's on fire. Oh, my and goodness. Then if you look at the crystal ball, inside of the crystal ball, it's a red, there's a little red screaming skull. Oh, my. But it's super wow. teeny. <laughs> and... And I imagine the 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 and the the brief for that was just just broad. Um, what yeah, I was don't think it, I don't think it said anything about the crystal wall or anything. That's just what I came up with. That's just uh, that's 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 fantastic. And you know, even even your clot sliver, like I mean, even your slivers, like so you. It's just like this. It's <laughs> it's a very you style. I mean, like it's the one sliver that I I don't that I don't have, and I I want to get it. So, but you have all these sketches of all these these pieces that you you've done. I mean, you just have them in your collection, uh, and, and and you know, well, I mean, I'm gonna have to, I do like, I'm gonna have to have pictures of them sent to me because I mean, this is this is pretty um, unprecedented. There's very few um, magic artists, especially ones from earlier on in the game, who who have that stuff on tap uh, just to show off. It's it's, it sounds pathological, but I've got pretty much everything. I've got marker comps for logos I did for Star Trek. I've got press proofs. I've got all these, all the preliminary drawings for uh, the magic pieces. I have all that. Jeff, um, if, if you feel compelled to snap photos for, for any reason, I would be <laughs> more than happy to give them absolute, like I could do an entirely separate video about the uh the the, the um that you're talking about i mean that's just that's, that's awesome well, I, could cert I could certainly show you a process thing from the the, pro the one that probably work would work the best like i said was metronomes because i've got six or seven pages of concepts of just trying to figure out how the gnomes worked 
leading up to the finished sketch, leading up to the painting. Um, for most of the paintings from Magic, the sketch was just a one-off. I just figured it out. And that original drawing is what ended up the original painting. Um, if you were to put any of them on the market, what, what, which ones would you choose? I mean, it would be almost like, um, I don't want to over dramatize it, not say like, you know, Sophie's choice, but, but, you know, just like, uh, it'd be a difficult thing to choose. Which ones do you think that you'd see yourself parting with if you did part with them? I don't know. Um, As I still have the originals for most of them, it would make it easier to sell those particular sketches. That being said, I think there's a life in the sketch that doesn't exist in the painting. Mm -hmm. um, there's an energy, a suppleness to the lines and the composition that sometimes gets, um, sometimes diminished as you go to final. I try not to do that, but it does occur. Um, sometimes I think there's more energy in the idea, even though it's rough, than the final fi finished piece. Mm -hmm. um, so you're you're saying that the, the sketches sometimes have more of a of a of a satisfactory feel to them than the actual final products. Sometimes, sometimes. But, well, you struggle you struggle with the, the painting. I mean, I'm still learning how to paint all these years later. Um, we all are. Um, but um, yeah, I think that. Because I have them all, I probably would sit on them, but, um, you know, easily. I saw you, Jeff, at uh, Gen Con for years, and when, when we finally uh, started talking a little more than, how are you doing? Um, he, uh, I was asking him about his portfolios. He would have these piles of sketches, tracing paper drawings, pen, pencil drawings, pen and ink drawings, in these portfolios at Gen Con. And he was selling the images very inexpensively. And so at one point, I, I knew him well enough to ask him, you know, Jeff, Jeff, you're, you're selling these really cheaply. How can you do that? And his response was, oh, it's only paper. <laughs> I'm like, well, yes, Jeff, but they're also yes. ideas. <laughs> they're they're, 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 they're self-contained pieces of art. And right, so the tech value besides the intrinsic materials used to make them. Right, like isn't the Declaration of Independence on paper too? <laughs> right, it's it's parchment and ink. Well, yeah, but it's more than that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'd be like, well, that's just a piece of paper. I'll take it. What is it? A cent for the the the, the, the Declaration of Independence? That'd be a deal for me, right? I mean, uh, in the broadest possible sense, sure, it's just a piece of paper, but but it's also an idea. It's, it is. It's, it's a key to a bit of narrative that might strike somebody's imagination and help convey a story or send them off to make a new story. Um, one of the best things about doing illustrations, certainly in the RPG field and wherever I have a chance, is adding to the background, the little details and such, whether a guy's eating a sandwich or reading a book or you know, operating some bit of machinery, that suggests a much bigger world than, in that, than what's being shown in that particular drawing. And you're telling a story with the images and it's world building. I, I really find that satisfying. And now, uh, I hope I hope people pick that up in the work as well. Well, and what also is uh, very like interesting about your, your work is that it, it appears to be like, use angles so well, it's almost like, I wonder, do you use um, rulers or do you, to keep the line so straight, like for instance, on, um, one of the ones that kind of, you know, really blows my mind as far as how many angles there are, are as caltrops, just so many, uh, so many, you know, so many, uh, what, what, I guess, what would be the, the shape for that? It's not triangles, but it's a well, Chinese it's, star t t style. Oh, the, the, the caltrops, those little, yeah, those little uh, triangular objects, yeah, um, yeah. those little spikes. Caltrops is kind of a fun painting. Um, I wanted to do something that was Asian themed. Kaigawa just came out, uh, and I and I actually had some, I actually had some samurais and stuff in my archives that I had drawn because I enjoy that sort of imagery. Um, I wanted to, the uh, the guy in Caltrops. He's wearing the little Tommy uh, samurai shoes with the toes cut out, you know, so that the big toe is separated in the shoe. Mm -hmm. um, and the room that he's in was my take on kind of a uh, an old Japanese paper house, so it's wood and thin walls and such. Um, 
I wanted it to appear a bit like a wood. That doesn't look like a woodcut, but I wanted to have that kind of a feel, like it was like, like it was an Asian composition rather than um, this standard fantasy. Uh, the turning the thing on an angle, I thought that that would give a little more of a dynamic quality to what's essentially a fairly quiet idea where the guy is tiptoeing around all these little objects. But I think by pivoting it all, it made it all, it made the image more interesting and created a little bit of visual tension. It does. And well, it certainly does. And, and it's just, and again, it's the, it's the, the angles. Now, is that all just done by hand or did you use anything to, to measure? Well, I probably used a ruler to draw the initial lines, but then they were painted. That's just so. And brush. That's just so, and to me as, 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 as a lay person, that's just beyond. And then, and then there's other, um, like just, the, I love the way that you use shapes as recurring themes, like for instance, like in Delusions of Mediocrity, you, you use these blue orbital circles and ovals. Oh, as, they're in miscalc too. <laughs> those, those same kind of objects are in miscalculation as well. And it's, it's just, there's, it's, it's the sign of just, it, it's that kind of cohesion that, that makes it work so well. Um, with Delusions of Mediocrity, I mean, I'm curious, because if the briefs are so vague, what was the inspiration behind that? It's almost like you have these, these epic stories uh, that, that you've been telling through your art that, that I think when the style guides came into, uh, into play, there wasn't so much of a chance to do that as, as, as the earlier pieces had a chance to. Um, I'd have to look for miscalc. I mean, uh, delusions of mediocrity. My presumption is it was uh, some guy seeing a better version of himself. And so the little guy is very cartoony and he's next to the sort of massive gin like uh, yeah. creature. Um, but, but I think almost like role playing, he was projecting himself into this idealized superhero character. And um, that's just what I came up with for it. Uh, I don't think there was a lot of specifics. Like I said, most, most of these briefs were very short. There, there wasn't a lot of information there. But it allowed us to explore things that we thought were interesting. And you got a lot of very different looking art from people because of that. It's such an interesting, I guess, dichotomy because it's called delusions of mediocrity. And yet the, the flavor text says nothing but second best will do. So my thoughts was, was that this idealized version of this guy having a delusion of something less than like it was almost like that was, works as well yeah i was i was curious if maybe that was the the um the the impetus if you will behind it now the uh, the, the 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 buffed up genie looking fellow uh for lack of a better term could be manifesting all of insecurities in the little nebbish guy that's looking up to him you know and yeah in, that's inter a very cool spin on it. Yeah, well, that's because I was like, it's because you, you know, you hear delusions of grandeur all the time, you know, but you never hear delusions of mediocrity. It's mm -hmm. an interesting thing. Um, in interdict, 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 interdict. interdict. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. Hannah's fighting in. a clot sliver there. That's what I was gonna ask. I was like, Hannah's that's that's a clot sliver. A Yes, yes, and uh, th that's that's that, that was that was exactly you knew exactly where I was going with that one. Um, but yeah, you're, I mean, your your goblins too. I mean, they can't be ignored. I mean, like, do those those do those take longer to do because of the amount of just dedic you know the amount of dedication you have to do to all the folds and the wrinkles and the the expressions. Uh, no, they're fun. They're a delight. In fact, um, I just when when COVID happened, um, really quickly, and I had all sorts of shows that got canned. I was supposed to be in Sao Paulo two weeks after Mexico. And that trip got canceled middle of yeah. March. Um, I started watching performers, uh, musicians doing little shows from their kitchen, from their apartments, because their tours all got chopped. And um, I was thinking to myself, well, I'm not a musician, but maybe there's something that I could do. And uh, coincidentally, a friend had sent a friend that I knew from Sao Paulo and a friend from Russia within a week or two of one another, both posted these very silly pictures of themselves, which I then used as the inspiration to draw goblinized versions of the two of them. So I drew them as goblins, put in the big ears and such. 
um, and then posted them up. People on Twitter thought they were cool. And very quickly, um, I think from about March 19th on, I started doing a drawing of an individual every day as a goblin. And I did it for 15 months. Um, so there's 500, 480 some odd individual drawings that I sent out into the world of people that just sent me their pictures on Twitter. Wow. And, uh, it was a blast. And what, and, and what would you charge to do that? I mean, that sounds like, I mean. <laughs> I was doing, a couple of people asked me to do them as commissions. Like, they, can you draw my kid or something? And so uh, they were inexpensive, like $35. That's but tough. but <laughs> I did the, the, the 400 some odd. Those were all free. I just did them and sent them out into the world. My goodness. Uh, that is, that is. It was something I could do. Very generous of you. I mean, I, I, that's. That's astonishing, really. It is, and and you know, just I just your attitude, I really do appreciate because you you, you have such a can-do attitude, and and I I really do want to see you return to the game because your 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 stuff is so unique. So I'm thinking with I mean, I mean at least we know that you're on the radar as far as being reprinted in 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 the mystery booster. So you know, like that's 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 my thing. So and um. You know, I, I, I just really want to see it happen. But before I, the, before oh, I let you, you go, I, I want to ask you, is there anything that you're working on now that you can talk about? Uh, or is it all NDA, um, that kind of thing? And then um, after that, I'll ask you some uh, p- Patreon questions. Uh, some goofy. Well, I'm a freelancer. So uh, doing these shows, I pick up commissions. And there are lots of them. I work on my commissions all the time. Um, that being said, I also paint new pieces that I try to use as tokens to bring to the show so that I have stuff that's useful to the new, get new decks. So, for example, I just did a couple of pilots. I did a samurai, I did a warrior, um, I did a shrine, all that will tie into the new Kayagawa uh, sets. Um, so I do, do create new pieces in that regards. Uh, I still take on role-playing game art when people ask me to. There's a French game called uh, Lore and Legacy uh, that I've been working on from time to time. I just did these for them last week. Um, but I'm and I'm working on a kid's book with my daughter. Really? Um, yeah, we've been we've been doing it. <laughs> it's not quite um, as quick as she'd like, but I'm uh, it'll be probably 24 pages, maybe a few, maybe 30 pages, um, awfully painted. And uh, I hope to finish that up in the next month. Is there um, is there a theme to it yet, or is that something you want to hold off on? Um, I should I should let her talk about it, but right, yeah, right. I know. But it's been it's been fun, um, and I'm stringing together my shows. Um, I'm going to be back in Spain uh, in a month. Wow! I know, I know, I can't wait. Um, Spain's there's great. A, there's a legacy event up near Bilbao. Um, I was up there at a magic. Grand Prix a number of years ago and a shop owner from Spain that I did some work for invited me to go so I'll be up there at the end of March or April um I'm looking That's forward to it madness and I mean I I I know that the the European uh, the fan base have a very um different just sorry one sec my my dog's up doing her you know it's the Europe it's the Europeans that are probably responsible for us talking right now because uh, in 2016, I started getting cards in the mail from Italy and from Spain um, asking for alterations. I'm like, alterations? What the heck is that? Aren't I wrecking the card? And uh, they liked what I was doing. Um, and I got invited to go to uh, Jerez in Spain for a show. And then I went up to Nebraska War up in Italy, uh, which was a blast. And uh, that got me to start doing the shows and that's, uh it's crazy but it's been delightful and they've been incredibly supportive yeah that's what i was going to say is that the european audience they they, they do have a, a great amount of affection for a lot of the um the artists who, who started the game out i mean there's just a great uh and i'm not sure i'm not sure why why it is i mean other than the i mean obviously the art's great. That's, 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 that's number one, but like maybe because it came 
it, it later on toward to, to them and they maybe they got they 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 were really waiting for the game to come to them and then when it came to them they were just like overjoyed with it i'm not, I'm not sure uh, i don't I can, know I, sh- I should ask them about that i do know that the game and we as artists talk about it from time to time it has impacted people all over the planet in very fundamental ways um when i finally started doing the shows my first show was santiago chile because that makes sense <laughs> that's so, so funny cool, what? It's so cool, though, you know. Oh, it was great. Yeah, when I when I got the idea that you could go overseas, I did very few U.S. shows up until after COVID. I was in Bangkok and Melbourne and Brisbane and Spain and France, and it was all over the place. Because why not? You like, can well, go. I mean, that's and if look, like, if you could, you know, go back all those years and say to your, you know, previous self. Hey, these these pieces of artwork that you're working on now are going to be the impetus for you flying uh, and becoming like a, a citizen of the world. You know, would you have believed it? Would you just been like, it constantly blows my mind. Um, I probably did a thousand black and white drawings for role playing games, but these 25 paintings I did for Magic are what has resonated with people for decades. Um, it's yeah, it's. Amazing. it's it is. It will. And it also it has to do. I mean, it's amazing how they do it, because it, it's not just the, the quality of the art, but the, you know, if you're playing a certain card at a time in your life when things are going well or you have a like a particularly victorious moment or if you have a moment where you are feeling low and you played a game and it made you feel better. I mean, these these deep seated emotions go connected with it and people bring that to it. And that's what makes it so special. People will say this was in my first pack. Yes. Know? I've yes. had this since I was a kid. Um, yes. This is my favorite card. You know, whatever, whatever the card is, this is my favorite card. And it's always astonishing and wonderful when you hear that. Yeah, it's, I mean, and you put, my... these, you put these things out like, like notes in a bottle. The imagery goes out into the world. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it gets found and it means somebody, something to whoever found it. Um, that, that's true with, uh, the magic cards is true with the role playing game cards. I used to have people tell me it shows, you know, this dwarf, that's my character. You drew my character, you know, and you're, you're always, you're always touched by that. It's, 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 it's amazing and wonderful. Is there a particular story that you would feel comfortable telling? Like maybe one where somebody came up to you and told you a very heartfelt experience that they had in connection to your, to your work that maybe touched you, you know, well, cer- certainly, um, the first time I got to Japan, several, uh, I was at Yokohama uh, for the Grand Prix. I had done a show at um, Heiko Schmidt's place, Tokyo MTG, the, a couple of days prior. I was Johannes Voss and I. And then we went to the Yokohama Grand Prix. And uh, Melissa Danish was there. I think uh, Tiden was there. I was there, and Johannes was there. And it was the sea of Japanese players, which was incredible to see. Right. Just all these people all playing the game. Um, I think it was the largest tournament I ever attended. Um, but they'd have, they'd have cues in front of the tables with um, like theater balustrades to uh, keep control of the crowd as if, as if they needed to control the crowds. Because these people, the, the folks you met were as light and gracious as can be um but several people during the weekend would ask for a photograph and they'd come and hug you and say i never thought i'd meet you and and things like that and that was always touching um but even more so i was at a show and a guy asked i I draw custom tokens for people um whatever you want i'll just draw a little picture and that can be a token for them so somebody asked you to draw a spirit token of his father who had just passed and so i drew his dad as a spirit and then the next day when i handed to him you know you could see him uh, very emotional about it yeah he turned and handed it to his brother who didn't know it was coming and he teared up seeing the drawing and that was unforgettable that's beautiful uh, to, to see a little you know a little bit of ink on paper that just meant so much to these guys and I was, it, was a, it was an honor to be a part of that 
that's that's you know and that's the kind of stuff where it's like you know can't money can't buy that kind of that, that. Yeah, i'm never gonna forget that it was just amazing that's beautiful i mean i'm about to cry my contacts out <laughs> And every, so often, do... every, so, every so often something like that will happen and it takes you by surprise and it's um, and it catches your breath. You're like, wow, did that just happen? Um, that's so that's so beautiful. And I, I can't I, I can't I can't think of a better way to to end the official interview with you. So um, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Thanks, Aaron. Jeff is a truly pleasant guy, ebullient even. And if you're interested in further ebullience, you should check out our Patreon. There's bonus interviews with Jeff and other artists, exclusive sales, perks, and shoutouts. Plus, it helps support the channel and things like a long overdue CT scan. And speaking of shoutouts, this week's episode goes out to Tony T and Eric DC. Welcome to House Markoff. Now, back to the matter of show and tell. I brought something very special that was gifted to me by none other than the mythic rare himself, Anson Maddox. But first, I want to show you Urza's mind. Take a look at the giant face. You got it? Okay. Now look. This right here is a recreation of Urza's mind itself. How cool is that? Okay. So, that takes care of the show. Now, I'm going to tell you that we have four. That's right, four original paintings from Magic the Gathering to reveal that are coming up in the next few episodes. So be sure to ring that bell, smash that like, and click subscribe so you won't miss out on all the goodness. And always let me know in the comments what you liked and what you didn't and what you think. But that's all for now. So until next time, I got a scoop. Whoa! I forgot that's how I used to close out the videos. Yeah, I definitely need that CT scan. Bye-bye!